Blondie to you two, the police to Genesis. This is 50 Years of Friars on Mix 96. On June the 2nd, 1969, Friars Aylesbury hosted its first concert at the new Friarage Hall. It featured Mike Cooper and Mandrake Paddle Steamer. Over the next five decades, some of the biggest names in pop, rock and punk took to the stage in Aylesbury, from Bowie to Simple Minds, the Kinks to U2. But how did a Buckinghamshire market town become home to one of the largest music clubs in Europe? I'm Nathan Cooper. Over the next two hours, we'll talk to those who organised it, went to gigs there and performed there as we find out why more than 90,000 people joined the club, why bands insisted on playing at Friars and how legends were born here in Aylesbury. This is 50 Years of Friars on Mix 96.
Eddie and the Hot Rods on Mix 96, a band who returned to Aylesbury last night as part of Friar's 50th anniversary. But the legendary gigs that are being celebrated nearly happened in a different part of Bucks, as co-founder David Stops explains. I lived in Princess Risborough. It was a bit schizophrenic, you know, Princess Risborough. Half the town went to Aylesbury and half went to Wickham. Uh, and I actually gravitated to Wickham, I have to tell you, because <laughs> I went to school there and I went to college there. But I had a friend, uh, Robin Pike, who was a teacher at the Aylesbury Grammar School, and he said to me, why don't we put something on in Aylesbury? So I said, well, Wickham may be, you know, not Aylesbury. And um, anyway, we did do it in Aylesbury. Uh, it was very much just see what happens. You know, we did the one gig, and I think we broke even on the first one, which was actually a big encouragement um, and the second week I think we lost quite a lot of money David was already well versed in the music industry both personally and professionally I was always mad about music but in those days it wasn't considered to be a career you know it's just like fun you know I was in local bands I was in a band called Gearbox who were Bucks group of the year 1966 <laughs> and various other bands and I managed one or two bands um, at that time local bands I found selling bands quite difficult but buying bands is relatively straightforward <laughs> so uh, that seemed easier to me and uh, it just it just evolved really despite securing the bands not being a problem and a feel a good summer to live long in the memory the club almost didn't make it beyond the last year of the swinging 60s that first year 1969 was absolutely magical you know it was the real post hippie period you know girls had long flowing dresses and or mini skirts uh, the guys had bell bottoms you know headbands and everybody wore beads it was that magical sort of post hippie period and i'll never forget that summer it was absolutely amazing but we didn't do very well financially um, and each week went by and we'd lose a little bit more um, and it got to the point in october where we were thinking could we carry on so we decided to put on one big concert to see if that would work. So we put on Pink Floyd in, in Dunstable. And it was a massive success. Uh, and we actually made more money on that one concert than we did on the 50 concerts that we'd put on in Aylesbury around that time. <laughs> Misunderstands. She's often inclined to borrow somebody's dreams till tomorrow. There is no other day. Let's try it another way. You'll lose your mind and play. Free gates for me.
Pink Floyd playing on Mix 96. Encouraged by the success of the Floyd gig in Dunstable, the organisers persisted with the Monday night shows in Ellsbury. And on December the 8th, 1969, a band who'd be a big part of the club and the town made their Friars debut. Hoople on Mix 96, who after their first Friars gig in 1969, would go on to become one of the most associated acts with the club. At one point, their fan club was even run by a fan from his Aylesbury home. Their first appearances were in the 400 capacity Friarage Hall, but that venue, like several future Friars ones, has long been demolished. The club switched to the Borough Assembly Hall in 71, the entrance to which is still visible in the Market Square near the Green Man. Finally, from 75 to 84, the gigs were held at the Civic Centre. I mean, the Civic was a great space, actually. It was, it was just a fabulous space because it was round almost. It was, uh, you know, everybody in the audience was right there with the band. The previous venue, the Borough Assembly Hall, was, the acoustics were very much, very much a challenge. Very echoey old sort of town hall type thing, but it somehow we had some amazing nights there. The venues define the club's history in phases. Each phase refers to a venue. One of the acts to play phases two and three, Steve Harley and Cockney Rebel. Done it all. You broke every code. Paul the rebel to the floor. You spoke the game, no matter what you say. The only metal, what a ball. So many lives 
There's nothing left All gone and run away Maybe you'll tarry for a while It's just a test A game for us to play Win or lose, it's hard to smile listening to Mix 96. It's local radio day and we're tracing the history of one of Europe's largest music clubs based right here in Ellsbury that celebrates an anniversary this year. It's 50 years of Friars. You just heard Steve Harley and Cockney Rebel who made their Friars debut in 1974. It was the organisers' ability to attract new talent or allow existing acts to express themselves like no one else would that really defines their attitude to music. Never more so than a chance they took on a man who was struggling to find himself musically when he first appeared in town in 1971. His name? David Bowie. Well, he wanted to write musicals. That's what he thought he was destined to do, write musicals. He tried a few live gigs, but they hadn't gone well. He even did Glastonbury in a small stage, and that didn't go well either. Um, so he thought he'd have one more go, and he met Al Cooper at a party in London, and we just put Al Cooper on in, I think, July 71. And uh, Al said, look, this is a fantastic place in, in Aylesbury, and the audience are brilliant. You know, you'd really like it there. So next day, you know, Bowie's people phoned me up, and we got the gig together for the late September. Uh, and he played it, and it went down an absolute storm, absolute storm. Uh, encores the lot, and he was so excited about the whole thing. He, th he realised finally he could play live, you know, because he'd questioned that. He didn't feel comfortable with live. And, of course, when he developed a character like Ziggy, he could hide behind the character. As long as he wasn't himself, he was fine. He wanted to hide behind characters, and that's when he came into his own. <laughs> In the dressing room afterwards, I was there with him, and he said to the other guys, he said, look, this was really good tonight. Let's go out and do it properly. Let's form a band and go out and do it properly. 
And of course, that was the spiders from Mars. They weren't called that at the time because he hadn't invented that name yet, I don't think. Um, but between then, uh, September and January, he'd written and recorded the Ziggy Stardust album. And uh, the opening line, of course, of which is pushing through the market square, so many mothers sighing, which refers to Aylesbury Market Square. Bowie performed Hunky Dory at that 1971 gig for the very first time, and it went on to become number one in Aylesbury, further proof that Buckinghamshire had fallen in love with the thin white duke, as Bowie would also later be known. When he returned in January of 72, performing the Ziggy Stardust album, the packed venue included the likes of Roger Taylor and Freddie Mercury. And it wouldn't be the last time that the town's audience contained movers and shakers from the music world. And then in July 72, he came back to Aylesbury again. Um, and Aylesbury was so special to him that he flew in 50 American journalists, especially for the gig in Aylesbury. And suddenly we were in the New York Times, you know, the Chicago Tribune, the LA Times. We're in Andy, Ho Andy Warhol's magazine interview, Rolling Stone, of course. So suddenly we were on the world stage. Uh, so he did us a huge favour there. Because I came in just for Aylesbury and then flew back again. And still to come tonight, we'll hear from a fan who got more than she bargained for at a Bowie Friars gig. <laughs> It's a god-awful small affair To the girl with the mousy hair But her mummy is yelling no And her daddy has told her to go But her friend is nowhere to be seen Now she walks through her sunken dream To the seat with the clearest view and she's hooked to the silver screen But the film is a sad thing for For she's lived it ten times or more She could spit in the eyes of fools And they ask her to focus on Sailors fighting in the dance hall
The legendary David Bowie playing on Mix 96. We've just been hearing about his unique relationship with Aylesbury. In 1973, his then-wife Angie actually sent a handwritten letter to a Friars fan advising them not to cancel their summer holiday for fear of missing Bowie performing again in town. You can see the letter on the excellent Friars website and it's typical of the relationship that built between performers and fans during a time long before social media. As co-founder David Stops explains. The David Bowie fan club was based here in Ellsbury, as was Mott the Herpels. So, you know, we it sort of spilled out from Friars into sort of more like fan clubs in the area and, you know, there was a lot of interaction and, and writing letters and postcards was the only thing to do in those days. It was a chance to hear and potentially interact with up-and-coming talent that attracted a schoolboy from just across the Bucks border to first visit the Friars Club. As a young lad in Tame, people would come back to school and say, we went and saw X band who were in the top 40. And you think, well, well hang on, how are they saying this? And they'd, they'd say, well, it's brilliant. We're getting in there 14, 15 years old. It's a club. And that was a whole new world for someone from Tame, wasn't it? A club. So it was kind of peer pressure. Or oh, we've seen OMD, or we've seen The Undertones, or uh, we saw this great new band there called The Jam. You've got to come and see them. So eventually curiosity got the better of me and I just loved it from the minute I walked through the door. That's Chris Williams, who'd go on to become a regular at Friars during the 80s. There was a gig where I went to see Altered Images because I fancied Claire Grogan and uh, I wasn't too bothered about the main acts and it turned out to be U2. Usually you wouldn't bother with the support band, you'd go in and watch the main band ignore the support. This time I watched the support and I kind of ignored the main band, just had a quiet drink in the bar and then people kept coming out saying this is fantastic so I went and had a look at that that was good
92 on Mix 96. It's our 50 Years of Friars special. Bono and co first playing the club in 1981 before going on to international stardom. Dire Straits, another of the biggest bands in the world who sampled life in Aylesbury in their early career. Although bassist John Ilsley remembers their journey into town was far from glamorous. I know it was really, really cold because we were on tour with the heads and, and we had, a, we, we had a, this is a sort of typical rock and roll story, but we had a transit van. And because we were the support band, we were in the back of the transit van and the talking heads were in the front of it where the heater worked. So I do remember shivering in the back of this transit van between gigs because that's all we could afford. They may have been short of cash and cold, but John knows how important it was to play Friars. It was our first tour, and um, I don't know, there was something about playing in those days in those sort of small and sort of more intimate surroundings, which, which, which was very special. <laughs>
celebrating 50 years of Friars Aylesbury. This is Mix 96. playing Blondie, one of the international acts to appear in Aylesbury. But why did bands want to fly in just to appear on stage in Buckinghamshire? And why, for a while, it meant there was simply too much choice for some fans? It's all to come as 50 Years of Friars continues on Mix 96. 50 Years of Friars on Mix 96. The car, Vauxhall Finance Leasing. From Blondie to U2, the police to Genesis. This is 50 Years of Friars on Mix 96. Above your beer and collect your face There's a row going on down near town Get out your mats and pray to the west I'll get out mine and pray for myself Thought you were smart when you took them on But you didn't take a peep in their artillery room All that run people's hairs on your chest What chance have you got to get a tie and a crest? Down the house of commas in your brand new shoes Compose a revolutionary symphony That went to bed with a charm in your clean
down my shirt We want a match for their untamed wit And some of the lads said they'll be back next week The Jam on Mix 96, one of many acts to appear in Aylesbury on more than one occasion, because as co-founder David Stops points out, as its reputation grew, Friars became the gig to get. It was really on the world map as a, as a venue. Uh, you know, people would come in from America, play Friars and uh, Hammersmith Odeon, as it was called then, and then go back, you know, if they wanted just to make a, 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 a sort of start in, in, in Britain. So we were very much, you know, one of the gigs to play on a tour. And if bands saw that we weren't on that tour, they'd ask the agent what's going on. We should be playing Friars. With such a wealth of talent wanting to play Friars in its heyday, some punters actually became quite blasé about their choices. It was just the magic time for music in Britain. Uh, I remember in June 1972, we had three gigs in a row. One was um, Lou Reed. Second one was David Bowen's uh, Ziggy Stardust tour. And the third one was Roxy Music. And that's just three Saturdays in a row. And you can imagine someone said to me, yes, I, was going, I went down to the ship, which is a pub that she's now also been demolished, unfortunately. And uh, shall I go and see, you know, Lou Reed now? I think I'll stay in the pub. You know, it was that sort of time, you know, which was just, just absolutely magic. Just a perfect day. Drink sangria in the park. And then later, when it gets dark, we go home. A perfect day Feed animals in the zoo Then later A movie too And then home Oh, it's such a perfect day I'm glad I spent it with you Oh, such a perfect day you just keep me hanging on You just keep me hanging on Just a perfect day Problems all left alone Weekenders on our own it's such fun Just a perfect day You made me forget myself I thought I was someone else Someone good Oh, it's such a perfect day Just 
just what you saw. Just watch your soul playing on Mix 96. We're still to come. We'll hear from the grammar school pupil who designed the famous Friars membership card, Genesis guitarist Steve Hackett, and the day the music died in Aylesbury. As 50 years of Friars continues. I'll do so many times today And I guess it's all true what your girlfriend say But you don't ever want to see me again And your brother's gonna kill me and he's six feet ten I guess you call it cowardice But I'm not prepared to go on like this I can't, I can't, I can't stand losing I can't, I can't, I can't stand losing I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't stand losing you I can't stand losing you Needs was a regular at the classic concerts and ran the Mott the Hoople fan club from his Aylesbury home. But he was just a 14-year-old Aylesbury grammar school pupil when his chemistry teacher, Friars co-founder Robin Pike, asked him to do some design work. If you look closely at many of the flyers, you'll notice a reoccurring theme. But what's the origin of the Friars rabbit? Here's Chris. For some reason, I've always drawn rabbits um, on people's Christmas cards and stuff, and the Friars rabbit was born. I designed the membership card and it's got that odd sort of squiggle thing on, on the back which, um, I mean, there were popular theories about that, frog in a boat, whatever. It was just an ink blot and um, I thought I'd do something a bit more defined and obvious um, which was uh, a rabbit doing various things every week and it was just a, a basically ripping off the posters uh, for the psychedelic clubs at the time, like the Middle Earth but adapted to a kind of Aylesbury style. And it was great fun. David would ring me up sometimes the day before the gig that they had to be handed out at. And I'd knock them up, he'd come and get them. They'd be done on this ancient Xerox machine, <laughs> uh, sometimes quite faint on different coloured paper, and dished out at that 
you know, the next friars. As Chris explained, advertising the gigs in those days was very different to today's concerts that sell out in seconds on the phone and online. To see a band at Friars, you'd queue on the day, or in some cases, days before. The likes of the police and Genesis returned to Friars as world superstars, and on both occasions, Aylesbury's cattle market was the scene of a human sea as fans queued for hours upon hours to see their heroes. Chris Williams from Tame remembers that waiting was all part of the Friars experience. Because I was technically underage, you couldn't really go in the pubs before too much. I mean, some of the more veteran people were doing that quite happily for most of the afternoon. And we kind of turn up there and have to queue up past the grapes and up into the market square, under the arch. I remember standing there and if it was uh, tipping down with rain, you'd be hoping to get under the arch because you were nearly there then, weren't you? And of all the gigs he queued for, which one stands out the most? Actually, the best gig I ever saw there, I don't know if it's just a state of mind, was Big Country absolutely tore the place up. They were unbelievable that night. That was great. They were, they were a brilliant band that night. <laughs>
50 Years of Friars on Mix 96 from that very first gig at the new Friaridge Hall on Walton Street in 1969 when 7 and 6 would get you a ticket to see Mike Cooper and Mandrake Paddle Steamer through to the 80s and bands like Big Country and the Lotus Eaters who played in June 83 at the Maxwell Hall. A ticket for that, by the way, £3.50. Friars spanned three decades of change in Britain, economically, socially and musically. His co-founder, David Stops. We started off as a bunch of hippies, basically. I am still a hippie. Uh, you know, we just love peace and music, man. Uh, uh, that was very much the vibe, 1969 to about 76. But then, of course, the Sex Pistols came along and the Clash came along and the Jam came along. And there was a real revolution. And it was a totally different approach from the punters. Before, it was in the hippie period, the biggest problem we had was people getting in free around the back. Um, that's sort of like free music, man, and this sort of thing. As soon as punk came in, there was none of that. Everybody paid, but, you know, it was much more lively, I think you could say. <laughs> and we had to... Uh, I suddenly became, like, commander-in-chief of the forces, you know, and, and we had a much bigger security team. And we did have to look, you know, we had to sort of um, sort a few problems out. There'd occasionally be an incident. If there was an incident, our policy was to, to get four people and carry them, one arm, one leg, one arm, one leg, carry them outside, gently put them down on the pavement, and then give them their money back. And it was the giving the money back is the bit they really got upset about. You know, that was the bit they couldn't handle. We don't even want your money. Eventually, money became a real issue for the organisers. With David's other projects and the advent of the video age, meaning fewer bands were touring, the club was forced to close its doors in 1985. People always wanted to play for us, but it was usually the, 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 the least well-paid gig on the tour uh, because they were doing bigger venues. So it got almost to all being favours from the bands. You know, if they play there, it was a sort of favour. The other thing was that I'd started managing Howard Jones in 1982 and I didn't have the time to put into it that I had before. So, um, you know, in 84, we didn't actually know it was the last gig. It was actually Marillion again at the end of 84. We didn't know it was the last gig. I was intending to put on more. But I think about six weeks after that, I decided there wouldn't be any more. And um, I remember the Bucks advertiser putting the headline up uh, the day the music died. Celebrating 50 years of UK.
Roy Jones playing on Mix 96, one of the final acts to play Friars before it closed. Many describe the time after 1985 as the dark or wilderness years. However, a 40th anniversary gig was held in June 2009 and due to its success, another concert was organised in October and again at Christmas with Kid Creole among those joining the celebrations. I am, I am honoured to be here. Thank you so much for still believing in the power of music. Thank you so much. A year later, with the Civic Centre on the verge of closing, the club managed to attract Paul Weller back to the town. Thank you very much for being here. Very nice to be on this very sad but very auspicious occasion as well. Some lovely times here in the past, and a very lovely time here tonight as well. Yeah. That night, with Paul Weller and John Otway, was the last ever event at the Civic, but phase four of Friars was not far away. In October 2010, they found a new home at the Aylesbury Waterside Theatre as Eddie and the Hot Rods and the Buzzcocks returned to town. and 50 years of Friars. In 2013, the specials performed a sell-out waterside gig. While the queues weren't quite to the cattle market standards of yesteryear, fans were still quick off the mark to snap up tickets for a band who, quite literally, were born in Aylesbury. The first time we put them on was uh, with The Clash in 1978. They were supporting The Clash and they were called the Coventry Automatics. And then um, Terry came out to me just before I was going to announce them as the Coventry Automatics. He said, look, we've just changed our name to The Specials. Can you please announce us as The, as the Specials? So that was the first time they ever did a show as The Specials, that, uh, that gig in 1978. They'd obviously been talking about it for some time and they'd made a band decision in the Friars dressing room to call themselves The Specials. So... We have a little historical connection with them, shall we say. And then they came back in 1980, uh, one of the biggest bands on earth, you know. It was just amazing, absolutely amazing. And here's Special's bassist Horace Panther speaking backstage after that gig in 2013. I was trying to think what, which of those songs we played this evening we actually played in 1978 when we supported the clash and i think there were a few of them but in sort of a different format yeah, you know, there's like yeah. a, you, if you'd have heard it 
you'd have gone, oh yeah, that's the song that eventually became Nightclub or eventually became, right. you know, yeah. she was too young or something. You don't too much, much too young. Specials on Mix 96. As we've just heard, they actually got their name backstage in Buckinghamshire, while Friars also prided itself on supporting local acts. Aylesbury's very own John Otway would often perform. He'd later have chart success and headlined a festival in the town centre in 1978 to 20,000 people. Howard Jones, who was scored in High Wycombe, was also a regular, as were Marillion, having themselves been fans at the venue. Here's Chris Williams again. The bands got so familiar with Friars that they would... Uh, work their own way around it. So I remember Fish from Marillion suddenly turning up on the balcony because there was an upstairs and a downstairs and mid-song he bolted off the stage and oh, where's he gone? And he suddenly started singing from the balcony and involving the audience and I've not seen many bands do that short of the Royal Variety performance but it's because he knew because he'd been there as a fan and he could get out and he could find his way up there and everyone in the bar sort of chatted to him as he's run through to do the thing. You don't really get that happening at bigger gigs, do you? It's that intimacy, that everybody knowing each other and the people who were the uh, the fans at some gigs turning up as the bands at later ones 50 years of friars on fire station celebrating 50 years of friars aylesbury this is mix 96 
That's Kaylee from Marillion on Mix 96. It's 50 years of Friars. For those who never got to experience the classic gigs in person, several recordings exist online, and another from the rock gods Motorhead will be available later this year. Here's Friars co-founder David Stops. When Lemmy sadly died at the end of 2015, um, when they went through his uh, belongings and his archives, they found this tape of a Friars Asbury gig, March the 31st, 1979, recorded off the mixing desk, which was absolutely amazing. And uh, BMG are putting out a bomber box set in the autumn, and they are putting out that whole concert as a, as a, a sort of bonus CD. Um, so we're very, very excited about that. And it's not just recordings that are still being uncovered. For one fan, the chance to capture his heroes up close and personal meant going to extreme measures. A few years ago, we came across a, 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 an amazing guy called Mark Jordan who took photographs at Friars. I mean, in those days, you couldn't bring cameras in and we'd search people as they came in because bands insisted that you don't bring cameras in. And now nobody cares too much. And the mobile phone, of course, you can't just start taking those off people. So um, he suddenly phoned me up one day and said, I've got some photographs of Friars in the old days. Would you be interested? And I said, yes, called really interested so i met him in the king's head and he produced these amazing photographs i mean i just I, my jaw was dropping i'm pictures of the clash blondie talking heads you know it, it just it just went on and on and what he'd done was he he put the body of the camera down his y fronts at the front and so when you're searching nobody's going to touch you there right um and he converted his trousers so that there were pockets inside the trousers where he had the lenses um, so that's how he got in and took them, and I'm so glad he did. In 2014, Mark's photos formed part of a Friars exhibition at the Bucks County Museum. It also featured memorabilia including drums from Pink Floyd, one of Mike Rutherford's guitars, an amp used by The Edge from U2, and a piece of David Bowie's costume, thanks to this Friars fan. During the David Bowie concert, when he took his jacket off and threw it out into the audience, and I managed to hold on to a corner of it, and the, the jacket was ripped. So but I managed to have quite a substantial corner of it, which I took home and put away in a little pot. And I don't know how we managed this, but it, we must have known somebody. Um, my friend and I managed to get backstage, and so I stood next to him. There was, of course, plenty more about David Bowie at the event, including an endorsement from the man himself. Here's an emotional David Stops speaking on stage at the exhibition opening, reading a text he'd received just a few hours earlier. It said, memories are everything, apparently, and I have only great ones of the fabulous Friars. Have a wonderful night, David Bowie. <laughs> Thank you. 
following David Bowie's death in 2016, plans were formed to celebrate Aylesbury's place in his career. A bronze statue, financed entirely by crowdfunding, now stands beneath the arches in Market Square, with fans from across the world flocking to the unveiling last year. Why did you come all the way from Italy? Well, I came because I'm a big uh, Bowie fan. I envy you. I would like to have a, a Bowie statue in my town. Bowie's so influential and um, touched, touched the lives of, of people of all age. We've come from Brisbane in Australia. Uh, we flew in specially early. Um, just to come to Aylesbury to see the unveiling. Rob Stringer, CEO of Sony Music, grew up in Aylesbury and attended Fryer's gigs. He also worked closely with Bowie and gave his reaction at the unveiling. I think he'd be very humbled by it because he was, you know, he, in, in his later years, it was all about the art and he was very low key. So he created personas, but he wasn't really out front now. He didn't really do any media work. So I think he'd be flattered, but I think he'd be very shy about the process. And there's more planned for the statue. An audio interview with designer Andrew Sinclair is set to be added to the site soon. On Mix 96, who Fry has put on successfully on several occasions when some of the public were concerned and other towns wouldn't even entertain the idea. The relationship with the band worked so well that David Stops once booked them to play at Stoke Mandeville Stadium for the local round table. However, singer Joe Strummer went missing on the eve of the tour that would include the Stoke Mandeville gig and the performance was ultimately cancelled, although The Clash would later return to town. There was no such trouble with another massive band who graced the Friar stage for the first time in 1970 and kept returning over the next decade. 
With Genesis, the first time I put them on, I paid them ten pounds, and then fifteen, then twenty-five, then fifty pounds, seventy-five pounds, and then a hundred. I was the first person on earth to pay them a hundred pounds. I remember Peter Gabriel coming and shaking my hand on stage and saying, "This man has paid us a hundred pounds." <laughs> announced it to the audience, which was a bit strange to do, but they really appreciated that. And uh, on one of their box sets, I wrote the sleeve notes. Peter Gabriel wasn't quite so happy at their first Friars gig when he broke a bone in his leg attempting to crowd surf. In the Genesis autobiography of 2007, chapter and verse, he blames a dancer in the crowd for moving at the last minute. He did finish the performance despite the obvious pain and bandmate Steve Hackett explained how they coped in the aftermath of the incident. We did a few gigs with him in a, in a, in a wheelchair and, but you know we had to stop because he was getting just as dangerous with waving around these crutches and hitting people on stage so uh, but you know he used to take tremendous risks and he was a great showman and um yeah that, that that kind of thing tended to happen i i think that you know he, he didn't uh, he didn't pull his punches do you know what i mean he he really went for it live and and that was um part of the appeal of the band because he went on to to kind of depict the action of the songs and act them act them out really live the songs and um um, at that time, I think it was even really before David Bowie was doing that kind of thing. So, um, a great front man. And Steve also told me just how important the gigs in Aylesbury were to the band. Oh, well, it was great for us, Genesis. You know, that meant that we were playing to what we regarded as the home crowd. And um, we could do sellouts there and be be uh, unheard of in the rest of the com country. So, I'm very grateful to... Um, to David and, you know, for sticking with it. Such as the band's gratitude, they asked to return in 1980, an offer David Stops and the organisers naturally accepted. And we had a queue that lasted three days uh, in the cattle market, as it was then, which is now the site of the cinema. The queue is fantastic. We had a cricket match, a football match. We, we provided porridge in a, in, a, in a wheelbarrow for people. We issued three magazines during that three days. Uh, so it was... Some people said they enjoyed the queue more than the gig, but it was a great gig. It was a Fantastic to uh, fill back.
Genesis on Mix 96. The band's Steve Hackett will return to the town for a sellout Friars gig at the Waterside Theatre in November, playing the whole of the classic Genesis album, Selling England by the Pound. Another act taking part in the 50th anniversary celebrations are Stiff Little Fingers, who were at the Waterside last night. David Stops. Stiff Little Fingers are a real core band for us. Um, we put them on originally supporting Tom, the Tom Robinson band, and uh, they, uh, the, you know, the Friars audience just took them to their hearts immediately, and they've played, I think, seven or eight times since then. And for frontman Jake Burns, it feels like a homecoming. It's difficult to know where to start, really, how much the place means to us. Uh, you know, from the first time we played there with the Tom Robinson band back in 1978, we were always made to feel hugely welcome and uh, so much so that, you know, it really became, it felt like a second home to us, to be honest with you. I mean, it was it was a show that we always looked forward to playing. Um, it was one of the first uh, dates you'd look for whenever a, a UK tour came through from the management or whatever. And, uh, you know, we, we formed such a bond with the place that uh, we recorded the vast majority of our, our live album, Hanks, uh, there. And, uh, and we're also hugely honoured to be uh, one of, I think, probably only two bands who have received not one but two Friars uh, Heroes Awards, which, you know, is something that we're, like I said, very, very flattered by um, and uh, just, you know, serves to, to cement the bond between the band and the venue. The gig this weekend isn't the first of this year's celebrations, with the town having already hosted the first of a new generation of Friars Acts. It was so exciting to get the vaccines in January because it was the first gig of our 50th anniversary year uh, and what a way to start. I mean, they were fantastic guys. Uh, and um, uh, the audience, I've never seen an audience anything like it. It, it, it. At the front you had screaming girls, then it got older and older and older as you went back until you got to the back of the venue and it was 70-year-olds. And a lot of parents had brought their teenage kids along, you know, and both really, really enjoyed it. I don't think I've ever done a Friars gig like that before, where, where it was so diverse. Uh, and the band were brilliant. As co-founder and on-stage announcer for many of the gigs, David Stops has seen a large array of talent in Aylesbury, from Queen to the Arrhythmics, Def Leppard to the Jam and Iggy Pop to Madness. So you'd think picking out a favourite gig would be difficult, but not so. My personal favourite was the Kinks, I'd say, because to me they're like the universal band, you know, they're a, a rock band, a punk band, a, a pop group. They just in, encircled everything, really, in, in music for me, and were great live, just amazing. I mean, Waterloo, Waterloo Sunset has to be the best pop song ever written, I, I, would, I would say without any doubt in my mind. <laughs> Feel dizzy 
Kinks on Mix 96 as we come towards the end of our local Radio Day special, 50 Years of Friars. Fans who enjoyed the legendary gigs on a Monday night in Aylesbury paid 25p to join the club and in doing so made friends and memories that have stood the test of time. Most of my friends have been my friends since, since those school days and we still talk about, oh, do you remember the time we saw the Go-Go's or do you remember seeing such and such a band, seeing the Pogues down there? And we still talk about those gigs or the things that happened or the time when Fish from Marillion put his cigarette out in our ashtray and somebody took it home as a keepsake. That's the sort of thing we do. Or you'd turn up there to see a band and Billy Bragg would be playing downstairs in the smaller bar and we'd all fall in love with him that day and think, well, this is just fantastic. Things like that sort of live on with you. So you, people of my generation end up buying those records even now or buying the greatest hits or the anthology or whatever. That's fan Chris Williams from Tame, who rightly says it's amazing. It all happened right here in the heart of Buckinghamshire. Just before you get to the Mix 96 studio, just on the side of the shopping centre is that brilliant montage of all the pictures of the people that are there. And as I was walking around to the studio, I just had a couple of minutes looking at it, and you see the Bowie picture, and you can see dear old Fish from Meridians in there. Uh, sort of unbelievable bands have played it. Anybody, it's like a who's who of... Uh, British pop music or punk music or rock music and it happened in Aylesbury. You've been listening to 50 Years of Friars on Mix 96 with me, Nathan Cooper. My thanks to David Stops, Chris Needs, Steve Hackett, John Illsley and Chris Williams for their time and memories and to Richard Carr at Bucks TV for access to his audio library. With the 50th anniversary celebrations continuing, more gigs are set to be announced soon as one of Europe's largest music clubs continues right here in Buckinghamshire.